Hey everyone, we're here with Mike Hayden, a previous CA bar style applicant and a current practicing attorney in California. Hi, Mike. How's it going? Hi, Shauna. It's going well as always. Tell me, you know, I was thinking you never really told me why you went to law school. What was the whole story behind that? Mid 30s crisis. Uh, the economy changed, the recession happened. I left the military. I was an army officer. You were in the military. Okay. Some of you know that they, they really pump you up and tell you you're going to be this great leader and you're going to be a leader in the corporate world and all this stuff. But unless you got the right connections, it's not really true. So I took a bachelor degree in political science at turn of the millennium. And I said, okay, I need to add to this. And I always wanted to go to law school. I just didn't have the ability because I was too busy or, you know, full-time work in the, in the, in the military. Mm -hmm. Finally, when I settled in California, I said, okay, I'm 34, 35. I got to do this now. It's now or never. 34, 35 to go to law school. That's like not the, the average start time, but good for you. And thank you for your service. So you went to law school. Where'd you go to law school? I went to California School of Law based in Santa Barbara, which is uh, distance learning. And how long did the degree take you about? It took four years, four months. Four years, four months. So did you work during that time? Yes, I did. And what did you do? Were you working like in a law firm or were you doing other kind of work? Well, just labor work. I was the gym guy, worked at the gym, 24-hour fitness. I was a driver. I did a lot of jobs, you name it. You were the gym guy. I love it. Okay. What was your life like? during law school? Because I know for me, it was dating and going to school. There were times I, you know, I loved going to school, but there were times I was like, I just want to kind of be young and, and free. Were you just working and going to school or was there more to it? Like what was going on in your life? Well, let me say this. I was happy to go at 35 mm -hmm. because I understood the business world a little bit better. Mm -hmm. I understood contracts a little bit better. I understood how things work a little bit better. Unless you're ready to take that on at 22 years old, it's kind of an eye opener. It's a lot. Yeah. And I was overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. It was my first year. Mm -hmm. I had just finished two trimesters. There was one trimester left and I knew I was going to have to take the baby bar. And tell our viewers what the baby bar is. It's a mini bar. It's a one day bar exam where you have four essays and four hours to do them. And then you have an hour and a half lunch and then you have three hours to complete a hundred MBEs. Right. Uh, so, you know, they are changing the format of that. I don't know if you've heard, but the state bar is going to be changing it to a hundred questions, MBE questions only in the near future. So you took the full day old school baby bar. I would call it, it's not old school yet, but it's going to be soon. And wait, they're removing you, the essays. They're removing the essays. Yeah. And, <laughs> How, dare How dare they? I agree. I mean, I li I like the format, the current format, but we have to roll with, I guess, whatever way they go. I mean, it always seems like they're changing up something and we can't keep up, but we have to pivot, right? Because, you know, in my realm, in my world, I have to take care of the applicants and make sure their stress is as low as possible. You know all about that. I think a lot of law students kind of feel lost sometimes, right? We're in California. We have over, I think, 45 law schools in this state. And after their first year of law school, law students have to take the baby bar. So you found the need to search for something like a tutorial. Why? I was having a hard time with the actual practice test for the baby bar that my school makes us take. Okay. And what was your baby bar journey like? I mean, I remember working with you and you had some bumps go on during that time of your preparation or was that mo more during your bar exam prep because we worked together for baby bar and then of course the general bar which we'll talk about in a little bit but what was your baby bar journey like you only took it once when we met was january 2014 you remember well, the exact year? Yeah, I'm like Rain Man with my days and times. You were actually a referral from our dean of students who mm. got a lot of positive uh, reviews from you from, from local mm. uh, law students. And I said, okay, I like your approach, your approaches, your program. And mm. you taught me how to get over my major hurdle, which was contracts. Because yes, I remember crim, that. Crim and torts are pretty straightforward. I had a good understanding of both, but you took me over that hurdle with contracts and UCC and everything. 
Yeah. That's, that's what was killing me. The contracts essay. And yeah. I did, I guess I just got lucky. I had two torts essays instead of two contracts essays on the baby bar. Yeah. I think a lot of applicants pray for that. And contracts is one of those Achilles heels for a lot of applicants and not only with the baby bar, but even with the general bar, it's one of the least favored subjects for sure. You know, from my perspective, law schools need to do a better job teaching contracts. It's covered in the first year. And at that time, a lot of applicants have never been privy to what a contract is. It's not something that is in layman's terms. A lot of the terms are very legal. And so you can come out kind of feeling like it's a foreign language and you don't understand it. So, you know, good job that you work through that. I do remember you kind of struggling with that, but you got it. You, you keep working at it. My torts and my crim carried me. And, and the funny thing with the baby bar is when you pass, you do get to see your results. Mm. Okay. So what were your results? Do you remember? I believe it's a 560 out of 800 to pass. Mm -hmm. And I think I got 569 or something like that. Like I just, I just edged by, but it's a pass fail exam and it's got a 20% mm -hmm. pass rate. So they do a lot of weeding out. It's not an easy right. shortcut. So you take the baby bar, you pass. And then what's the rest of your law school like? Is it pretty smooth sailing until we no. kind of, no, no it, okay. It, it, On it a personal level I mean, or... Once we got into civil procedure and property and all the other first year subjects that was taught that were taught to us, I just took it a day at a time. I really put the work in. I really studied. I really read all my cases. And, you know, you were the one that taught me don't focus so much on the facts of the cases. Just what's what's the rule that came out of it? I'm going to have a lot of law professors getting mad at me for that. But yes, <laughs> the facts of the case Irrelevant, but you're right. I mean, get to the, the nuts and the bolts, the holding of the case. They want you to know Hawkins versus McGee and all these other landmark <laughs> cases that are wonderful. And you Look know, at you busting out case names. Okay. But you got through law school, it took you so a total of four years. That's a big commitment. And you're working, you're working out, you're keeping shape. I remember when I met you, you were like, still buff guy, you know, keeping up your health. And then you go to the law, you know, graduate law school, and then comes the bar exam. And I want to spend, you know, a good amount of time because we worked for years together with this exam. And we have to kind of give a Cliff Notes version to something that was an incredible journey of perseverance for you from my standing and my perspective. And I think a lot of people, you know, before we get into your story on this, don't realize that Applicants that have to repeat the exam many times, it's not that you're not as smart right, as others. This is a game that you're playing with arguably the hardest exam in the country. And there's a lot of individual tones, right, that go through taking an exam of this caliber. So if you would be so kind as to walk me through your personal, you know, feedback on your journey with the exam. I'm back in evidence when you said that. <laughs> ah, that's what made me almost quit for sure. That memorization of evidence. I took the bar nine consecutive times and that had nothing to do with Shauna or her program. She's a wonderful tutor. This had to do with me. And the one consistency that Shauna told me is Michael, you are not 100% focused on this. You are focused on other things. You have to be devoted to nothing but the bar. Some people have to work 40 hours a week, but their evenings and weekends have to be dedicated to the bar. What happened to me is my mother was literally dying from, from cancer, you know, bone, renal, you name it. She was going into a last ditch effort surgery on her kidney. But this was after my first bar failure. I failed the bar the first time and everybody's like, it's okay, get back on the horse. You didn't do that bad. We're doing this again. But the whole time I have a dying mother. My mother, God rest her soul, this is the type of person she was. She was determined to have me pass that bar. I remember. She, she lied to me and had her aide or nurse text, short texting me, pretending it was her so I wouldn't come running home in February Wow. And when I came I home, after, I took the bar in February. Mm. I come home. My aunt tells me, my uncle tells me, Michael, you got to get home. You got to get home right away. Your mom's not got many this days. This is after left. the first time taking it. Second time. Second time. Second bar. Okay. And, but the first time taking it, you know, she's not doing well. You know, I have right. that on my plate. So and you have a mental toll. You have a yeah, mental block, I'm sure. 
Mm -hmm. right, second bar. So I get home. My mom holds on for me, passes away three days later after I get home. Mm. You know, she didn't want me to see her suffer. She didn't want me to see her like that. But back to the yeah. bar, the whole time it's it's going on in my mind. Of course. I'm getting ready for my third bar. And I have my paternal aunt who's broken her foot, who's a cancer survivor herself. Her non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is coming back. Oh, no. And I have to take care of her. And no. I'm, I'm an only son. I'm an only nephew. I have to keep the family going. I have to keep my father going. I have to, you know, family finances, everything. So mm -hmm. I, got, I got hit with all this important stuff in 2018. It was a whirlwind. My life changed. And then my aunt's dying, you know, losing her memory. She's in full-time memory care, visiting her while I'm trying to study for the bar, staying home. And she passes away January 2019. And that's right before I'm going to take my third bar. Your third bar. bar. Sorry, number four. So, so uh, even when you started your journey at Bar Prep, you, you knew quite, you know, in, soon into it that your mom was sick. And I can tell you from my own personal experience of having also a mother that passed away from cancer, it, it's there. Like no matter how much, you know, you have to go on, right? You're pushing through and I, it's the mental. But you were correct. You were correct in saying that, Michael, hold off. Don't keep, don't keep doing this. Hold off until you are ready to devote your time. Yeah. 2020, my maternal aunt passes away. So That's my two whole, months. Yeah, That's my whole family tree, you know, we were a very close family. We were a very tight family. All of a sudden, everybody's gone. It's just my dad and my uncle and me. What advice do you have? Because I think a lot of applicants go through a lot, whether it's grief. You know, I've seen it all. So I've seen literally a, a father whose daughter was murdered during bar yeah. prep when some in the beginning of my of my courses some you beginning of seeing more you, you, you have yeah, to what, what 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 do you do what do you do in those scenarios when you're you have a goal like the bar exam right so here you are yeah. you're, you're you're having family members pass away which grief is extremely heavy right i've been there like i said and it's so heavy what do you recommend it in that moment what what got you through do you think because you you persevered no matter right. how many times time, you took time it got me through time the fact the fact that i was focused mm -hmm. on the bar when when i passed it was it was july 2021 mm -hmm. the dust had settled everything had settled now is shauna told me michael you're not no, i'm not doing the work that i'm supposed to be doing i'm shortcutting i'm looking at examples instead of writing my own essays I'm not writing down my adaptive bar MBEs. I'm not writing down the rules, which really the helped methodology, me. the tracking. And, you know, I, I you were a hard worker. I, I remember your process. And, and one of the reasons I wanted you to come on is because your story is incredible and your perseverance is incredible. But really, you did the work. I think you just had a hard time doing it the way that I wanted you to. And I don't think it was uh, an intentional doing it on your own terms. There was a, a block going on. I think a lot of it was definitely your personal, which a lot of applicants will be able to relate to because the world keeps turning, right? When you're doing bar prep and you're faced with, here's this goal that I've wanted for so long. I went to law school and spent all this money. And now I want this so bad, but I have a lot of personal stuff going on. And how do I weigh that? Right. Because there's never a perfect time to take the test. Right. But there's definitely a better time. And so you, you definitely had a block. You spotted a disconnect and said, Michael, there's a disconnect going on somewhere. And I thought back to my childhood. I thought back to my adolescence. It was something that was always swept under the rug because if you have a job and a structure like the military, it's really good for it. But I am in fact, ADD. So in all your childhood and even in the military, nobody and throughout law school, this never was on any, no professor, no, uh, you know, higher up there. No one had ever observed and thought that of you, that you potentially heard from a baby. Back in the 80s and 90s, they're like, you're not putting forth the effort. You know, they didn't know much mm. about it back then. Well, yeah. And I think mental health was not 
as focused on back then. Like for me, I have a lot of anxiety and it was just, you're really sensitive. You're really sensitive. And now in in my forties, I've realized, no, I have generalized anxiety disorder and I, you know, have to work through that. I'm not just sensitive. It's something that is actually like a mental health issue for me that I work on. And wow. So thank you for sharing that. So when they, you know, when the doctor psychologist came out, right. And said that, was that comforting for you when you heard that? Was it kind of like, that's why I've been feeling this way? Yeah, I was able to do accommodations. And then that was able, I was able to get time and a half, which slowed me down a little bit, slowed my brain down to where, and then, yeah. you know, because the problem wasn't my reading comprehension. It was me flying through everything 100 miles right. an hour. I remember that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah, when you and have saying, like, why are you speeding through this? Why are you doing this set so fast? Right. OK, so that makes a lot of sense. So when you were diagnosed with ADD and you were getting treatment for that, was the next bar the one you passed? I got a lot closer. OK, so that was like bar number eight. Number eight. I got back my score and my MBEs were in the top. 68th or 69th percentile of the country. Wow. So you saw a significant improvement post the actual, you know, ADD diagnosis Mm -hmm. and treatment. So that was very helpful for you having that accommodation. You had the accommodation in the eighth attempt. Yes. Right. But then you take the ninth bar right after. So are you going consecutive back to back? Back, I never did. I never missed one bar. That's pretty impressive. That perseverance is incredible and really inspirational. There might be applicants or people that are judgmental and say the guy took it nine times, right? You shouldn't be a lawyer. I couldn't disagree more. I think the perseverance of a repeat applicant is like nothing I've ever seen in my 15 years of doing this. I've worked with everything from, you know, everyone from a two time taker to a 25 time taker. And the perseverance shows a lot about character. And I think we need a lot of a lot more of that in the industry today. So you take the ninth time and did you know coming out on that ninth time, like, did it feel different? Yeah, got it, it. was good. And then the MBEs, I was pretty solid on them and I'll never know what I got, but I, I passed. So I must've did really well all around. So what did that feel like when you saw your name is on the pass list after all these years and losing your mom and your aunt? I mean, what did that feel like? This gets better. My best friend, my best man at my wedding, died of a heart attack at age 44, five days before my results. I am so sorry. It's a lot yeah. of grief. It just didn't so stop. Sorry. It, was, it was nonstop for me. But the, the silver lining was that I passed in November 2021. I, I swore in, I believe it was the 15th of March, 2022. So I've wow. been practicing almost two years now. Well, that's quite a story. I have chills and I had to hold back some tears. Grief is such a heavy topic, but it's a relevant topic, right? It's part of life. And to go through that much during your bar prep and law school journey, you know, you said time is what what really got you through it. And I'm sure support. Any other tips on getting through grief during uh, your law journey? Any other any Um, other things that helped you? Well, some people will do a three-year program. Some people will do a four-year program. Some will do ABA, CalBAR accredited, unaccredited. It doesn't matter what your journey is. You just have Mm -hmm. to prioritize law, which is not fun in every single subject for most people or easy for most people. But Mm -hmm. you just have to say that this is who I am. This is what I do. And that's what got me through infantry school. You just have to say, this is who I am. This is what I do. And you have to believe that. This is who I am. This is what I do. I absolutely love that. So even when you're dealing with something like grief, you keep going. Is your point. You You keep keep pushing. pushing. Granted, when my mother passed away, I should have taken a bar off. When my aunt was the same way, I should have taken another bar off. We all could say should have, right? We all can look back. I, I, I can really relate to that. You know, when my mom passed away, I, I, we buried her at her funeral. And then literally two weeks later, I was teaching day one of of the July course. And I remember in retrospect, I should have stopped. But I do think that sometimes we throw ourselves into to do, whether it be work or studying for the exam or whatever else can keep us busy as part of the grief journey. I feel like sometimes 
it, it helps. And even though it might not be the right thing to do in retrospect, like I should have taken time to really absorb that and sit in it and to have sat in it a little bit more. It, it is at least in both our journeys, right? We can connect on that for sure. Saying we threw ourselves into bar prep, you threw yourself into continued bar prep and I threw myself into work. And it, it was something as a distraction, really, just to not want to deal with it because the pain was so heavy. Yeah. So that is, you know, we can we can look back and and of course that is your journey. And if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. But I'll tell you that I think uh, everything's meant to be. You were meant to keep going and you did and you got it done. All right. Well, that was pretty heavy. And thank you for sharing that. I am uh, always going to be so unbelievably proud of the perseverance that you put in and and talk about the practice of law. So what's that been like for you? I have my own personal injury clients. I say it's a good uh, area to start practicing in. So do you have your own law firm? Yeah, it's small. It's not, you know, I don't have uh, shareholders and, you know, partners or. Why or, do you need you that? Know. Sole practitioners. It's the way to go. My dad was a sole practitioner for 45 years. Yep. You run the you run the shots. I also do work for Unite the People based out of Long Beach, and they're a nonprofit law firm. You know, they need lawyers because there's a lot of people that are serving time. The private prison system, that's another discussion for another podcast. I mean, I would love that. I found that I'm able to go into the prisons. I'm able to go into jails. I'm able to get along with the incarcerated. I mean, this these are lives. These are people's lives and liberty at stake. That's the that's the most important area of law, I think, is someone's liberty. That's wonderful. So you're working within criminal law as more pro bono, mm -hmm. right? And then you're also doing personal injury. That mm -hmm. is incredible. And didn't you uh, recently have some like high profile client? Were you working with well, yeah, someone? It's public, it's public record. I was uh, second chair on the on the Tory Lanez case, the rapper. What was the outcome of that case? Still pending. His appeal is pending, and we filed a writ of habeas at the same time. It's like dropping Look at things. You into writ of habeas. I am so impressed. I mean, and so you are going to continue personal injury. Do you think that's where your career will will keep at right now? Because your face lit up when you were talking about the jail system and the yeah, issues going I do, on there. I do like to do them both. I think they go well together. I've done uh, preliminary hearings. I've made excellent records. I haven't done a uh, trial yet. I don't have trial experience. Coming. It takes a while. It's coming. It'll come. Yeah. But I've so done in your, trial. in your, you know, in the years that you've been practicing, what would you say is a challenge in the practice of law? Do you think coming out of just your law school journey, bar prep journey, obviously it's very different, but well, yeah. What would you say? Any, any challenges you have faced? That just, you would want people um, to know about? Just fitting into your niche area mm -hmm. and you have to get used to, you know, the lingo. You have to get used to what's expecting. You have to get used to putting yourself on the record and, you know, good morning, your honor, Michael Hayden representing defendant, blah, blah, blah. And it becomes automatic. Just the procedures, the actual procedures of going to court. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. I remember my first time in federal court, the judge was on this huge pedestal and I freaked out. I almost like peed my pants. Literally. I was so freaked out. I was like, I'm leaving. I don't know what I'm doing. I just sat there kind of, I was hoping they didn't call my case too soon because I could watch the other attorneys and then kind of just mimic like where they were going. When, when my case was called, I went to the wrong side, you know, and there was, there were microphones there. I think I bumped into somebody. <laughs> it was like kind well, of a shit. Tell, if you tell the judge or you, you tell the DA that this is your first or second or third prelim or something. They'll, yeah. They'll, they'll work with you. They'll work with you. They're not, the lawyers aren't out to get each other. That's what people don't realize. It's not like the television. Great point. You know, Great point. Like, Elaborate on that. That's that's such a good point. It's one of the first things that my dad taught me. People think it's so adversarial and it does become that. But the more that you can actually work with the attorney or opposing counsel. Good relations. Exactly. Right. Good I've relations. Gotten deals, good, you I've gotten good plea deals. I've, yes. put, I've put things on the record at prelim that, you know, raised some eyes. And then the DA kind of, you know, didn't like me. But then after mm -hmm. that, we, we stayed friends. And file. yeah, and, and the more you can get along with your opposing counsel, the more that you can get your client's case resolved in their mm -hmm. favor. And it doesn't have to be drawn out as much, right? When it becomes too adversarial, I had to learn that the hard way early on. I'm sure I'll be talking about that throughout more and more episodes. But today was about you. And this was really, really great to hear the full story. I mean, it's obviously the Cliff Notes version, right? I mean, there's so much more to it. 
I want to conclude with just one final question. And thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. What would you tell an up and coming law student who's, you know, maybe in their first year and feeling really lost and kind adapt of and overcome. You know, just the, the age old saying back in my infantry days, adapt and overcome, adapt, overcome, persevere, you know, like you can, right. you can complain about the changes. You can complain about how hard it is. It's not going to get easier being a lawyer you know, isn't for everybody. But once you make the commitment, once you're. And I do think like street smarts, right, are really important. Like you're like you said, you know, initially your business background, your military background, that all really comes into play. I mean, it's, it's great to be able to read and be very scholastic in nature and academic. But when you combine that with street smarts, right, and, and real world experience, the combination can be electric for the practice of law. And that sounds like where the road is headed for you. So good luck on all your future endeavors. I hope to have you back on soon and hear more and more about what you're doing. And definitely maybe that aspect of the prison system here in California. I'd like to talk more about that. And what was the, the group that you're working for in case listeners want to look it up? Unite the People, Inc. Based, based out of Long Beach. Great. Okay. Well, thanks for their work too. I would always give Caesar McDowell and Unite the People a good shout out because they're not pro bono, but we're we're low bono, we say. Got it. Got it. Okay. Not pro bono, but helping people in any way you can. Anyway. Congratulations on all your success. I'm really looking forward to seeing what your next chapter holds or chapters. So thanks so much, Mike, again for coming on and I will talk to you soon. Have a great, great rest of your day. You too, Shot. Thanks. All right. Bye. You've been listening to Law Life, a podcast about navigating law, life, and everything in between with host Shauna Carpellis. Thank you everyone for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for episode updates. For more information on the show or preparing for the California Bar Exam, you can visit us on YouTube at CA Barstyle and at cabarstyle.com.